In this episode of the LA Business Podcast, we talk about an ad company that recently exited. We talk about how it started in the year 2010, um, changes in the advertising business, and the key sort of metrics you look at when you know you're on the cusp of big growth. Let's jump right in to this week's episode of the LA Business Podcast. Welcome to the LA Business Podcast, your destination to hear stories of how businesses grow and scale. I'm Robert Brill, CEO of Brill Media and the host of this podcast. Now, let's jump right into this week's interview. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the LA Business Podcast. Today, our guest is Gabe Gottlieb, co-founder and CEO of Pathmatics. And Pathmatics is a digital ad intelligence platform that tracks and analyzes online ad strategies. Uh, we, we definitely want to learn more about what Pathmatics does. Tell us a little bit about why and how you started the business and let's let's hear about the journey because you recently exited and sold which is congratulations i think that's probably the dream of a lot of business owners um tell us a little bit about pathmatics sure yeah it's been it's been a journey is the right word it's been a journey so um i founded the business a little over 10 years ago with my co-founder tom um we'd worked together previously at microsoft and we're you know interested in starting a business we actually are outsiders from the space. So uh, we had a good friend who was in the you know, digital marketing space and said, hey, there's a lot of opportunity here. Publishers don't know, <clears throat> excuse me, which ads show up on their site. Advertisers often don't know where they're showing up. And you know that shouldn't be the case. And we kind of, as good software engineers, dug in and started looking at the problem and realized, hey, absolutely, that 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 shouldn't be the case. You know, digital marketing since it's digital by nature, it should be very transparent, it should be trackable, you know, obviously with privacy constraints and all those kinds of things. But you know, when you compare it to a billboard or a TV commercials where you don't know who's sitting on the on the couch, don't know if anyone's even there. With digital, we have all the information and we felt like this was a, a space that didn't have transparency for no good reason. So we founded the business, as I said, about 10 years ago. Started very simply, the two of us um, in a in a small co-working space, coding away. Um, we were both software engineers by trade, and um, you know, kind of just just built a, a very very simple um, first version of the product. We only covered desktop web advertisements, so this was about ten years ago. You know, all those annoying banners um, that folks see, uh, you know, that you see as you're browsing browsing the web. Annoying. <laughs> what do you yeah. mean annoying? That's how I make a living. <laughs> I make I make a living doing that as well. Yeah. Um, no, but uh, uh, yeah. So we uh, we started with with desktop display and the business. From there, I, I always say we're not rocket scientists. Like it was very organic how the business grew. You know, we started with as I said those 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 banners and clients said, hey, can you track can you track video? And we said, absolutely. You know, we can track videos. So we did video. They said, can you track mobile? We said, sure. So we added added mobile. Obviously, you say sure, and then it, it takes you know years to, to code and develop. Um, we added social, we added all, all these other channels, and, and we really, over the last 10 years, n- not strayed very far from that initial vision. And so if you looked at the product, you know, it's gotten much better, with all sorts of, of enhancements, but kind of the same core data around who's advertising, how much are they spending, what creatives are they running, things like that. It's just turned out to be, um, to be really valuable. And, we, I don't think we didn't realize it at the time because we were tech guys, you know, when we, we'd worked together at Microsoft and, and obviously we're, we're digitally native, but digital was still early in its infancy 10 years ago. And, and, you know, there were all these, when I was doing investor presentations, I included all these um, slides where like, you know, TV advertising would be up here and digital advertising would be down here and say, Hey, in a couple of years, it's going to, it's going to surpass um, the digital is going to catch up to TV. Well, now you look at those graphs and digital's up here and TV's way down here. It's kind of amazing. And so. Right. It, and it was, it was MySpace. It was like MySpace was going <laughs> like this for a while. And then it was going like this and Facebook was coming up and then no one knows about MySpace anymore. No, exactly. And that was exactly. right around, that was right around 2010, 2011, where it's like, all right, we're, we're seeing the race in real time in the, the, the diminishment of viewership or, 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 or consumption on MySpace. That was a very interesting time. And the question was, is Facebook brand safe? Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. It's still kind of a question, actually. People, uh, you know, there's still a um, slow question there. Yeah, so super interesting time. And I think, you know, uh, we were early, but as we as we built product and, and kind of really found what marketers wanted and, and, and which parts of the data were interesting and what actually helped them make business decisions, the market was growing around us. And so 
we were very fortunate over the last couple of years. The business has grown very substantially. Uh, you know, we got to work, we get to work with you know top brand names. Uh, you know, all the, all the top agencies in the space, many of the top CPG financial etc. marketers. Um, yes, yeah, so the business business was going you know growing really well. Um, we we became profitable, which is a really exciting milestone for us. Yeah, you know, as I'm sure all the business owners listening can, uh, can. When did you? How long? How long after? So a couple of things. What's interesting to me is that you started the business at the sort of like right in the middle of the the Great Recession. Like this was this was a time when there was a lot of uncertainty. I mean, was this a reaction to that, or did you want to change? Why Why did you move away from you know Microsoft and, and starting this business? Yeah, I think it was reaction to change. I mean, we we'd been cogs in the wheel for a while. You know, we both kind of rose rose in the rungs a little bit, but it was it was part of a big machine. And you know, we didn't. We joked like there was literally nothing we could do to to move the stock price. You know, like we could we could be the best coder in the world or the worst coder in the world, and and the stock price would would be the exact same. And and you know, it'd be all the big company gripes. Um, you know, Microsoft is a great place to work, but still very bureaucratic, still very big company. And so yeah, the reaction was. You know, regardless of the economy, uh, we were bullish on technology, bullish on digital, and we thought, "Hey, let's let's build a company that that we want to work for, and hopefully, you know, other people want to work for." That was what really was the learning curve? What was the learning curve to get into advertising? Right, because you weren't you weren't a native of the advertising community. It was very steep. Yeah, it was. Um, I mean, there was there was work. We were tech guys, so this was also the time when programmatic was really starting to. Um, uh, you're starting to be to, to be talked about, and so I think we got that quickly. And then it was kind of learning the advertiser advertising world way of doing things. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I don't know if you know what a, a jeans party is, but um, a jeans that, party, no, a jeans party. Know I mean. So this was a, a term I learned when we got to advertising. So apparently, when a oh, I do know what a jeans party. Yeah, is. when a pub- get your custom jeans. Right, right. So a publisher wants to sell ad, ads to an agency, right, and get the agency to buy them on behalf of, of their customer. And so they throw a party at you know a fancy one of these designer jean stores where jeans are whatever three hundred dollars each or something. And everyone you know you get drinks, you, you hang out, and you get a custom a custom pair of, of designer jeans you know on on the brand. And this was like that kind of thing kind of blew our minds as uh, as engineers. Uh, oh, there we go. These are my custom sneakers. <laughs> so you went to a sneaker party. Yeah, I went to a sneaker party. It was, and and the reason these are, so, I named my dog ice cream, so like that's why it's because it's connected to some something I really love. But the idea is that, um, like, I got them a size too small, so I never actually could wear them. Oh, but now you got to get to put them on display. But yeah, yeah, I mean, like, totally. Like, I I remember working at Universal McCann. Uh, I, I I was on the varsity team. Like, I was on the the theatrical release. Uh, yeah. My first advertising job out of college. And it was like, let me put this away. And it was like, you're on the ad, you're on the you're on the varsity team. The first two months, I worked in advertising. Literally, I was getting paid to learn. I had no idea what was going on. I barely knew what a banner ad was. This was in yeah. 2004. Um, and there, and we went to Spago twice. And I was like, <laughs> all right, I'm just out of college. Right. I'm gonna get paid in food. This is great. <laughs> right. And, and you're probably ha- like you're happy to happy to get paid in Spago, right? Legit, yeah. legit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, it, it, to your question, it definitely is a, a learning curve to learn advertising. But I think I think we came at it with a very data driven perspective. I, you can probably tell already that I'm I'm a data driven guy and very kind of you know show me the data, show me the facts. And so I think clients appreciated that and saw that we were coming with data, saw that, you know, we, we, we were very focused there. And so I think that enabled us to enamor ourselves with clients, even though, um, you know, maybe we didn't know the space extremely well. So, so is your point about the jeans party or the, all the gifts and all that stuff that like buyers were making decisions that maybe weren't data driven? hundred percent. But to be fair, but to be very fair, 2000, at least when I started in 2004 to 2010, there was a it, it was still the business was was categorized as an as an as a relationship business. Yep. That's all it was. I mean, Absolutely. there was data, sure, but th- there wasn't the real time feedback loop that you now have with programmatic advertising. A hundred percent, I agree. And I mean, were, and your business was the usher was part of that usher of change that capitalized on that programmatic ecosystem. No, I like to think that I like to think that we brought change. I, I got a, I got a question for you actually. Having sat on the theatrical team, I think that was something that really struck me. Was that obviously in LA, we, we we talked to a lot of the studios, and it felt like 
I mean, advertising movies are a tough thing, right? Because you've got a, you know, essentially a weak window when you're trying to get everyone to buy, you know, and you, you know this better than me, but, 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 but buy, buy tickets for the weekend. Right. It's, it's that right? one Friday that, that one weekend is makes the next 15 years of <laughs> revenue of the movie. Right. So, but the interesting thing is, so then you're very risk averse, right? Like you're going to run a very similar, like the thing that worked with the other movie, you're going to try to run. Like there's, there's no incentive to experiment or change. I disagree. I disagree. Okay. okay. Um, and I got to give kudos to some of the people I used to work with. So my, I had a, a number of people I reported to. I was like the literally the lowest on the totem pole. I was like an assistant digital media buyer, right? Paid to learn. Yeah. Um, just don't make mistakes was <laughs> and when I did make mistakes. I got my hands up. Um, but I will give it to the the folks that I work with. Elias, I used to work with Elias Splishner, Rob Dickahoot. Um, Elias is now running, I don't know, has a massive title at Sony Pictures. Our client at the time at Sony was Dwight Keynes. He was a decision maker fundamentally that g- gave us the opportunity to actually take risks because I've worked at other, I've had other jobs at other major studios who took no risks whatsoever to the point where they chased, they put money into like Spider-Man. Like who puts aggressive advertising money to Spider-Man when you know it's going to open big. Sony pictures did that because they knew they had something and they, they put money into it because it was, it was going to be even bigger than it could have been. The point is, Sony Pictures, I got to say that they they took the risk and they allowed us to do really interesting things to the point like When a Stranger Calls, the movie When a Stranger Calls, we actually won an award because partially because of the contribution of Sony, partially because of what we did on the media plan side, we we're doing an AIM, AOL Instant Messenger bot wow. f- on cool. like in 2006. A chat, we did a chat bot phone. before chat bots were a thing. We did a chat bot. We did um you could call a phone number where Jill, the 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 main character who was getting calls from inside the house, like you were talking to her, saying <laughs> whatever, having a conversation, say, hold on, there's people, there's weird conversation, there are weird calls from inside the house or whatever. Yeah. So you're experiencing the movie, and that only happens when the leadership at the top likes to take risks. But I see your look, I see your point. If you have a formula, stick with it. I just wanted to point out that like no, I appreciate that. really appreciate talented that. people at Sony, I think did an excellent job. I and mean, probably you might imagine that's the reason why I love advertising so much because of that experience with Elias Plischer and Rob Dickahoot and 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 Dwight Keynes and Joe Epstein and whatnot. And I mean that's that's the beauty of advertising and especially with digital is you can experiment and you can play around and you have the data, right? You can be super creative. I think I still think there's a ton of really interesting like storytelling and other things we can do with digital that folks that folks aren't doing aren't you doing today? And you have, I mean, think about, you know, pacing out messaging, right? Like, if you know, you know, a user saw it, saw it, certain messaging, you can give them further messaging. I think there's a lot of really interesting creative and storytelling things. Um, yeah, and people are starting to do that. But I think I think it's a, it's a really big opportunity still going forward. So, I mean, I mean, how, so tell us about like the, the, the time in 2010 and, and really tell us about like, when did you become profitable? When, when did you realize there's light at the end of the tunnel? Yeah, so long, long distance between 2010 and that. Yeah, so so um, maybe I'll to the second part first. So so yeah, I mean, we became profitable um, in 2019 uh, was our first first year of profitability, and you know we 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 were a venture funded startup. So you know the goal was take venture funding, spend it to grow the business, you know, grow faster than you can organically. But I mean, I will say as a as a, as a CEO, it keeps you up at night watching that bank account tick down and and knowing that you're. Um, you're burning and either you know you have to reach some sort of milestone either a funding milestone or an exit milestone to keep it going so um yeah it was incredible when and and our business is interesting because we you know we gather a ton of data right and so there's a lot of cost in gathering that data and then the more customers we have kind of the 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 lower the cost is per you know per client and gathering the data so um yeah so that that dynamic allowed us to to reach profitability and uh it was was a huge milestone and then uh no, no surprise. We, we, we've remained profitable since. So, so what do you do in that case when you see you see the tally running lower, and uh, you you know that there's a finite amount of money, even though it's you know it's not coming out of your personal bank account. You are the steward and the responsible party of it. What what actions you take, and what lessons you learn along the way about optimizing this to the success of your business? Yeah, I mean, I mean, hopefully, I mean, there's a couple of ways that goes, right? Hopefully, and this was the, was the case. We, we kind of lived both both edges of the sword. 
you know, hopefully you're growing fast enough. You can tell a story, you can paint a picture. And so you can get the next, you know, the next round of funding done. You can get the next investor involved. You, you know, like we talked about timing, you know, there, there's times when, when our space was hot and there's times when our space definitely wasn't hot, you know, in, in kind of 2016, 20, 2015, 2016, 2017, you know, people didn't like ad, ad tech or anything near, near ad tech. Now ad tech's hot again and ad tech was hot um, kind of in, in 2012, 2013. And so, you know, you have to hope that and, and execute so that your, your business is growing and you're in a space that people want to fund and, and get funding, or you have to make the hard choices to try to, to, you know, constrain, constrain burn. And, and, you know, we did, we did have a, a point in our, in our history where we, we grew a little too fast, you know, on the, on the headcount side. And, um, you know, sadly we had to, had to lay off folks. And that was, you know, that's, that's the worst thing as a, as a business owner that, um, you know, looking someone in the eye and saying, you know, sorry, we messed up. There's not, you know, not a position for you anymore, but, but you have to do it for the sake of the business for the sake of the other, of the other folks, folks so working you- there. Do you, do you, do you like pile on on salespeople? I mean, look, I've, I've, I've had enough, uh, my, sh- my fair share of pitch meetings, um, to know that there's a lot of salespeople in the marketplace, very talented people. And <clears throat> a lot of companies in this space, they a hundred percent focus on relationships and they focus on, you know, human to human selling. Yeah. I, I believe fundamentally that changes now as, as we're, as we're into this, you know, much more robust place where. Instagram and Facebook and advertising, B2B advertising becomes more robust. But like going back to 2010, 2013, 2015, 2019, what do you, what are your, what are the key drivers of that growth? And of course, I get your point. You got to be, you have a you have to have a good product. You have to be in an industry that is, uh, it, it is ascending or has some good positivity towards it, right? You, you can't yep. sell something that people don't want fundamentally, but like, what do you focus your effort on? Do you get a ton of salespeople? Like, tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, I'm. I, so I, I didn't go into my background too much, but I, I studied computer science and finance at, at, at University of Pennsylvania. So I kind of have, have two sides of my brain, but definitely the kind of product engineer, you know, kind of coming up through Microsoft, you know, taught me about building products. So we were always a product-led company, and, and our our philosophy was always, you know, build the best thing and just be very differentiated and. You know the, the salespeople have have a much much easier time. I mean, there are, are plenty of companies that are uh, in our space in the other direction. You know, very sales driven, like you said, relationship driven. You know, kind of really salesy. A lot of a lot of flash and no, you know, sizzle or whatever the the saying is. And so, um, so we we really tried to make a name for ourselves with the best product, the best data. But then, you know, you touch on hiring salespeople is it's kind of I I always say like like when do you push on the gas and when do you let off the gas and it's really hard to know when that's the right it's the right time to do it because you know, you want to if you're, if you're feeling momentum you want to press on the gas and you want to you want to go but it's hard to know is this sustainable momentum or is this just like hey we got a couple you know we got a couple deals and and it's going to dry up again and then when you're actually doing really well you know if you don't step on the gas then it's almost too late right like then you're then you're letting opportunities go because it takes takes a salesperson you know maybe six months to ramp up on a, on a complicated product and really get, get productive. And if you, if it takes you, you know, two, three months to find that salesperson, you're, you're nine months out from when you, you know, say step on the gas to actually have that, that, that button seat, if you will. And so that's been something came to the, I think is, is one of the hardest things of running a business and especially a startup where you're really, um, really pushed to grow is knowing when, you know, kind of when you're feeling the signals and when it's right to, to step on the gas and when you have to have to back off on, on those sales hires. Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, ta- just talent overall in the, in the programmatic advertising ecosystem is, I mean, look, there's ebbs and flows, but generally there's, a, there's not enough talent, yep. right? There's, yep. there's way more jobs than there are, you know, talented, um, hands on keyboard or account people or salespeople or whatnot. And when you find them, boy, you gotta, you gotta love them. You gotta love them. So they stay. And we're in a we're in a time right now when that's at its its peak. I think. I mean, talented folks have any number of opportunities right now. It's just it's just a, a really I think unique time, and when it's really hard to find those people. And, and you know, but but you need them because because the market's really growing. Yeah. Okay. So so you're a product driven company. So it, is your is your strategy um, to to get sampling to so get people in front of your product to take a look at it. 
and they are going to fall in love with it. Is that kind of like the overall strategy? Yeah, the, the cool thing about our, our product is, so we gather data, um, whether you're a client or not. So we gather our data um, through opt-in panels primarily. And so we're gathering a really interesting sample of what's happening in the advertising ecosystem you know, across across the board. So you know, if, if you're, say, in auto insurance, right, we've got data on Geico and Progressive and Liberty Mutual and all these, all the top top players because our panel sees these ads. And so we can then go to, a, you know, one of these these players and, and basically show them what we would show, what, what they would get to see if they were a client. And so we can go in and give a really data-driven pitch and say, hey, whatever, I'm just making this up. Hey, Geico, you know, we see Progressive is investing here. They're running this kind of ads. You know, they're really doubling down on, on Instagram or, or whatever it is. And we can teach them something in that first first sales meeting and and that that's i mean that's an incredible advantage we have in, in terms of, of of just being a business where we can do that and so you know we've trained our salespeople and our our you know our outreach folks and stuff like that to really lead with data if you if you if you send a generic email you know like you said you get pitches all day right it falls flat but if you send an email to, to geico and say hey geico i noticed that progressive is doing this liberty mutual is doing that you know why are you guys doing something else right and and that'll get their attention hopefully that gets the meeting you know and then and then we get to and so our goal is really just get that first meeting have that data driven discussion maybe they're not ready maybe they you know don't have the the capability in house i mean there's this thousands of reasons why it's not the right time it's not the right the right buy but that usually really gets their attention and then yeah and then we 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 try to try to really map out like hey here's how you're going to find value here's you know here's the path to, to, to purchase and and to success you know combine success as a tell client. us about tell us about how the last year and a half has been for your company and uh you know, it's been a whirlwind roller coaster since about March 13th. March 13th was that Friday, the 13th, when South by Southwest was canceled. And that was my notice. I was like, holy cow, this is going to be a, a big deal. Yeah, wild, wild ride, definitely. Um, we, I think right around that date, you know, we, we had an all hands and we, we, uh, switched to working from home. And, you know, I think I had, I had on the slides, hey, we're going to do this for a couple of weeks and see what happens, right? We all, all laugh at how, how naive we were. Um, you know, we obviously started building contingency plans like, hey, what, you know, what's our cash situation? You know, what happens if, if people don't pay their bills? What, you know, all these things. Um, we were in an amazing position though, because we track digital and because that's where everyone went, right? Like everyone went home and piled on their Zoom and their, and their computers and their TVs and their mobile phones. Um, you know, that's where every, what, what everyone wanted intelligence about. And everyone, it was such a time of uncertainty all our clients wanted to know what was happening in the market, what were other people doing. And so uh, the, the thing that helped me sleep at night through those first few months was our usage skyrocketed. So we, you know, we tracked how many people log into the platform, you know, how often are they logging in, and we hit just all time highs, which, you know, was I talking to customers who were saying, hey, we're a, an agency for travel and we're going out of business because, you know, all five of our travel customers are, you know, pulled out, like absolutely, where we getting those calls. but. You know, the vast majority of our clients were logging in, you know, often and, and really using the platform. So, so that helps us in, in the early days. And then, you know, uh, I think like most businesses in our space, you know, kind of that, that Q2 of 2020 was that weird time. Um, and then Q3, people said, hey, like, we got to do digital. We've got to keep investing. You know, the economy is not going to fall off a cliff. And so... Q3 turned out to be, you know, kind of started slow and then ended incredibly well. Started out to be record quarter. Q4 was a record quarter. Q1 of the of uh, of this year was a record quarter. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, you talked about our acquisition. Uh, you know, kind of, I guess it was probably late Q3, early Q4. We started having um, really interesting, really interesting companies, you know, knocking on our door asking us about our data. I'd known the uh, sim the the. Uh, sensor tower team uh, for a long time. Um, Alex, the CEO, uh, and I, we shared an investor. And so we used to hang out at investor conferences and, and talk about things we could do together that we never, um, we never um, did a formal partnership. And, and he was seeing the same thing, uh, you know, so, so sensor tower is very focused on, on mobile. Um, we're, we're the leading uh, provider of, of mobile app intelligence. And so you know, he was seeing the same thing, like, Hey, everyone went home and, and, and sat on their phone. Right. And, and so every brand overnight had to become a mobile brand, it had to become a digital brand. And so, so he was getting asked about, about you know, the, the further, you know, kind of digital outside of mobile. We were getting really asked about, hey, can I see more about my consumer? Can I see more about 
about my competitors and I see more, you know, specifically on mobile. And so we started talking and it just, I just kept getting more excited, more excited, the more we talked, you know, how we could tie our data sets together, how we could tell, um, you know, our clients just a much, a, a much broader story, a much, much more powerful story. And so, you know, fast forward to, to May of this year, we, we officially tied the knot. So, so Pathmatics became part of uh, Sensor Tower. And then now, um, now we get to tell a much bigger story to clients. And we're really starting to see that in the market where, um, where we can kind of tie those insights together and tell, tell a really interesting story. What, what's the motivation to exit a business or what was your motivation to exit the business? And I, you know, I'm really interested from the perspective, like, like it's always interesting when, when two companies merge or, or acquire whatever the case is. And, 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 but as a business owner, it's a completely different like equation, right? Like what's your motivation? Is it financial? Is it family? Is it being able to tell a bigger picture? Is it money? Like tell us a little bit about how those conversations go. Yeah, I think that there's some interesting dynamics for us. You know, we're a, we were a venture back business. And so, we, as I said, we took money. Uh, the first money we took was in 2012. And, um, you know, those venture investors have a have a clock. Um, you know, we had uh, I was fortunate to work with incredible investors. And there was never a like, hey, Gabe, we need our money back or hey, Gabe, you know, it's time. Right. But there was a kind of the, the nudge nudge at, at, at the board. Dinner. It was like, hey, how, how are we doing? Uh, you know, any, any interesting inbound? You know, and I started to get the picture that the venture, venture investors were um, you know, ready for a return. And, and candidly, I was in, you know, uh, my, my co-founder and I had put, put money into the business, never taken money out. Um, and so, you know, also we, you know, we built something really interesting and it felt like it was time to take, take, as I say, take some chips off the table. Um, this deal was interesting in that, um, you know, the, the investors got cashed out and then, and then the, um, you know, the, the employees, uh, you know, and obviously most, most prominently, my co-founder and I actually rolled a very significant portion of our proceeds into the combined entity. So we're, we're we kind of got the best of both worlds, where we got you know got some liquidity, got to uh, call it a win, but but we're in for the next round. And and you know so I get I get it's kind of ticked all those boxes where we get to get to invest in the next thing and, and really feel I'm I'm super optimistic about that about kind of the broader vision. Yeah, I mean it's interesting. Like Pathmatics has a really, in my opinion, has a really great brand name in the advertising space. Um, Thank you. And, and I'm not and I'm not familiar with Sensor Tower, which probably is just m- much more a me thing. Do you do you have the sense that Sensor Tower has the the same name recognition as Pathmatics? So it's really interesting. So I think we have that brand recognition in the marketing space, and and you know it's I, I appreciate you saying that. I feel like you know one of the metrics we looked at is like, hey, people actually put you know I know Pathmatics on their on their LinkedIn profiles, right? Like that's a cool thing where you know like, hey, hey, the brand's really resonated with like. Someone is saying, "Hey, I have skills in mathematics as a as a you know attribute of their of their abilities." Um, so so we yeah we feel like we've got a great brand name. Sensor Tower is that brand name, but in the in the mobile space. So if you talk wow. to like a mobile first brand, you know someone who's say a mobile mobile gaming company where they make all their money on on uh, you know on, on, on mobile, they're like many of the KPIs are driven by Sensor Tower data. You know, comparing themselves to the competition, understanding their their share of downloads, understanding you know a competitor's retention versus their retention, like board, board you know from 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 day to day user acquisition teams all the way up to board level. Um, you know, Sensor Tower is that brand name. We we were in we're in a bunch of ten Qs. You know, when uh, an S ones when when companies file to go public and they and they talk about how good they are, they often cite Sensor Tower data, um, which is really cool. So. Yeah, we're in an interesting position where we're a company with two really strong brand names, and I'm sure you as a marketer can, can empathize with this kind of an interesting interesting challenge to, to figure out how to navigate, but a good, good, good problem to have as well. What, um, as we wrap up, Gabe, what does the next year look like, or as we kind of like finish 2021 and go into 2022, I mean, like there's all kind. there's still a bunch of uncertainty. Not, I'm not specifically talking about the ad markets, um, but I'm talking about like the world, like Things yes. are closing down. Events are, as we speak earlier today, an event that we're marketing just got shut down. Um, so, what 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 does the world look like? Do you does that uncertainty? Do you feel that uncertainty, or is it more stable? Considering, just tell me about what the next year, year and a half looks like for you. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I don't know if you're asking from from a business perspective or as a as a business you know owner and 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 kind of kind of C level executive, but I, I think from from the there's a lot of interesting questions around our team. You know, I mean, we we let our you know we as a sensor tower uh, the combined business. You know, our, our lease was up in San Francisco, so like like everyone did. If your lease was up while you were working from home, you let it go. And now we're we're trying to decide, hey hey, do we 
how much space do we want? Do we make a long-term commitment? Do we make a short-term commitment? You know, I, I tend to be the, you know, and, and, and so we on the, on actually the, it's probably a little interesting color. So we on the Pathmatics side actually opened our office here in LA, um, you know, required vaccination. A bunch of the team came back. It was amazing. Then a couple of weeks later, we got the, you know, the LA County uh, mask mandate came down. We had the, you know, obviously we're gonna abide by the mask mandates. So we required masks in the office. Uh, attendance dropped, though didn't drop to zero. Actually, I was there. I was there yesterday, and there were probably you know, six or seven other folks there. So, um, so I think I think folks are really craving that return to normalcy. That you know, I never thought I'd say I, I can't wait to get back in the office, but I actually I was really excited to be back in the office. So, you know, I think there's there is a ton of uncertainty, but I think you know we're a robust a robust country, a robust species, a robust industry. You know, COVID has always come in waves, and and there's kind of these waves of, of pessimism, waves of, of uncertainty. It feels like, in my mind, we're kind of cresting one of those. And I'm, you know, on the on the on the you know sea level executive team, I'm advocating for let's get space, let's let's invest. You know, mm. it's I, I think you know I obviously starting a business you have to be an optimist, but I think you know all the trends are going our way, and then I think you know I think I think we'll we'll be robust. I think in my peer group of entrepreneurs, uh, I'm definitely the pessimist. <laughs> and I'm finding that I'm like one of the very few. I'm not not a pessimist in that. Like I think, I just think I, my belief is that this is not going to be a thing that rolls by quickly. I think the next the this will be a five. We're in like year one, year, the first year of a five year time frame of massive uncertainty. Interesting. Yeah, uh, that's what I am. And then that and then I'm talking about like being able to travel like leisure travel. I'm talking about f- feeling comfortable going out into large public spaces like we have a two and a half year old like I, I can't travel. I can't get on an airplane with an unvaccinated two and a half year old like yeah. that. To me, that feels like the wrong thing to do. And I and I, under, I also understand that there are a lot of people who feel like that's not the wrong thing to do. Right. And and the difference there is fascinating to me. What about the business? Tell us about Sensor Tower. Like, what from a business perspective, what components are you focusing on? Is it improving the product, more sales, other marketing? I'm all of the above. We're we're in hyper growth mode. We're we're growing super quickly. I think we have a really strong and differentiated product. You know, we, we both did kind of independently, and then the combination. You know, I mean, it's 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 ours to win here. Like, if if you know, it, we've got these really interesting data sets. We're, we're starting to build the first, you know, the first stitchings of, of connecting together. Both teams have had a really robust roadmap. So, you know, we're trying to make sure we deliver on the promises we made, but also, you know, we feel like we're sitting on this really exciting opportunity. So we wanna, wanna dive in. So yeah, for us, it, it's a number of things. I mean, we're, we're building more features on both products. We think, you know, digital advertising is growing, growing rapidly, mobile is growing rapidly, but the combination of our data sets are where the really interesting, you know, you know outcomes are. And we think, we think that's really, really exciting opportunity. I do have uh, two more questions for you. One, sure. I want to talk about the iOS um, change. But before I want to talk about that, I'm actually really curious. When you say you're in hyper growth mode, what are the what are the things you look at that tell you, okay, yeah, we're in hyper growth mode? Is it purely numbers? Is it headcount? Is it requests? Is it leads? What do you look at? Yeah, I think it's all that. Yeah, I mean, re- revenue growth, um, headcount growth, you know, we've got, I don't know, 30 open positions or something, you know, like, as, as we, we said, it's a, it's a really tough time to hire, but um, we're aggressively trying to hire. Yeah, it's, it's leads coming in. It's and it's I think addressable market to the back to the kind of step on the gas, step on the brake. It's like, you know, there's a really interesting market right now, and you know, so there's going to be more competitors. There's going to be more folks. There's going to be more data out there. But we're the leaders right now. Like it's ours, as I said, ours to win. And so you, you want to lean into that you want to want to get there before before others do and, and build those relationships and build those long-term relationships with brands and agencies and folks out do, there. Does your data look at, you know, the recent shift in iOS and, and 14 and use of Android versus iOS and attribution, does your data go into any of that or is there any viewpoint you have on that change in the market? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's fascinating. So, so, um, you know, we, we, we sit in an interesting spot because we, we measure through panels, as I mentioned. And so the cool thing about a panel is you're not just a pixel on a user's, on a user's, you know, page, or you're not one app that's trying to track across other apps. Like when you're a panel, you actually see, you know, and, and we obviously get the users to opt in and we're very privacy focused, but you get to see the user's journey across apps and across what they do. And so, I think that's super powerful, and so we've been been able to see, um, you know, we we're, we're, we're able to see really interesting things. I think, you know, you mentioned attribution. Um, 
one thing we've seen is an area, um, uh, it's called ASO, so essentially app store optimization, right? So it's, it's thinking about what keywords you put in your app name, what keywords you put in the description, how do you title your app, right? And that's, you know, that's always been an important part of mobile, but people are really, really interested in that now because they've lost the, tra the trackability of other, of other um, channels. So you know, they used to run app install ads across a bunch of ad networks. They've lost the ability to track that. And so like, hey, like, let me do the thing I know if I invest in will work and I know there's like a clear ROI. So let me kind of get back to basics. So we see a lot of folks kind of getting back to those interesting, uh, interesting basics. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, it's gonna change. I mean, the, 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 marketing, the marketing landscape's gonna change. I think it'll be really interesting to see you know, obviously Google's the other other big player, and they're they're in, they're out, their their cookies are off, cookies are back on. Like they they um, you know they can't keep, seem to keep their story straight. It's next year, it's year after. Um, so I think that that dynamic would be really, really interesting too, because people we see people also using what's happening on Android as a benchmark for for iOS, kind of as a um, as a proxy. And so if they lose that proxy, I think that would be. Change. Yeah, the the world the world of twenty the digital advertising and marketing world of twenty thirty is going to be very different. Clearly, it's just a question of how and when those changes are going to come into effect. We've seen the first shoe to drop, I think, with iOS. Brand becomes particularly important. Yeah. Going back to basics, nurturing creative. audiences, creative, right? Like you know, yeah. I mean, we always say creative is is over fifty percent, right? But I think it's it's super important. Yeah. Awesome. Gabe Gottlieb, CEO and co-founder of Pathmatics, now with Sensor Tower. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode of the LA Business Podcast. If you like what we're doing on this podcast, please consider subscribing on Apple or Google Play, leaving a five-star review, and sharing with your friends. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for a guest you'd like to hear on this podcast, please email me, robert at brillmedia.co. Thank you. Have a fantastic day.